Well, hi, everybody. I hope you guys are ready to worship. Let's worship. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> well, Father, we do. We just thank you for this time. God, we just ask that as we enter this time of praise and worship for you, Lord, we just ask that. Lord, you would meet us here. Lord, let us glorify your name tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Greatest day in history Death is being you have rescued me. Sing it out. Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out. Jesus is alive. He's alive. Forever I am changed When I stand in my place We are God's living face to face I adore Jesus, you What a glorious way
I count on one thing The same God that never fails You'll not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out Yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley Yes, I will bless your name Yes, I will sing for joy When my heart is heavy All my days Yes, I will Count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now There's no waiting The same God that never fails Working all things out Working all things out Yes, I will Lift you high in the lowest valley Yes, I will bless your name Yes, I will sing for joy When my heart is heavy in all my days Yes, I will for all my days Yes, I will to pray to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. I choose to pray to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. Yes, I will. Lift you high in the lowest valley and Yes, I will bless your name and Yes, I will sing for joy When my heart is heavy in all my days Yes, I will for all my days Yes, I will for all my days, yes, I will. Of the goodness of God 
Happy birthday. <laughs> good evening, ladies. It's good to be here. <laughs> Happy birthday. That was yesterday. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Morgan. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I did not expect that. I was expecting Dylan, but not that. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Alrighty. Well, last week, he's still, he's still back there too. <laughs> last week, we began our dive into the practical section of Romans. <laughs> you guys are just going to embarrass me. Double. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> you guys are sweet and I feel very loved. 
Um, so last week we talked about what it looked like to serve the Lord and to use our gifts for him. To Oh, sorry. To work toward unity in the body. And this week um, we're going to continue through three more pieces of the practicals. So we're going to look at submitting to government authority, loving our neighbor, and putting on Christ. But before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for your word to guide us and teach us. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me and let it let just everything tonight just be all of you, Lord. And for your glory in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> so turn with me please to Romans 13 and we're going to start in verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil... Be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger who executes wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. I want to start off by looking at some of the dynamics in the Roman Empire during this time, just as a reminder. So Paul wrote the letter to the Roman church um, while he was in Corinth during his third missionary journey sometime between, but sometime around 57 AD, give or take a couple of years. <clears throat> This was just during or right after the time that Nero became emperor of Rome. Nero, we know as one of the most, if not the most, notorious Roman emperors. Of course, modern historians are now walking back many of the claims about the nefarious things accredited to Nero, saying that those who wrote the things about Nero were nothing more than um, jealous so senatorial elites who made everything up. Now, all these modern historians have little more than conjectures to go on, besides some newly unearthed shrines and celebrations to and for Nero, built by the people who were all but required by the law to worship him. These same people who also worshipped deities, deities which in their own mythology acted in the most vile, heinous, and unspeakable ways themselves. But I thought it was worth mentioning considering the times that we're in, when history for a fact is being rewritten. So as mentioned, the Roman Empire was widely polytheistic, believing in multiple gods, including the emperors themselves in that category. Historians note that the Romans were largely accepting of most beliefs and religions, as long as these beliefs and religions were also polytheistic and worshiped the emperor as was their perceived duty. That meant that Jews and Christians alike usually got a bad rap, and they were persecuted off and on throughout the time of the Roman Empire. In fact, Claudius, Nero's adoptive father, banished all Jews from the city of Rome during his reign. So being a Christian was not easy in early Rome, especially during the reign of tyrants like Nero. In fact, less than a decade after Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, the infamous Great Fire occurred in Rome, which Nero blamed on the Christians. And this, of course, led to a greater persecution of the church. So in Roman times, there were a lot of things for believers to gripe about and be afraid of. The men who ruled over Rome in the first couple of centuries were widely debaucherous and wicked and ruled in a way that was con completely contrary to the Bible. I can imagine... Um, it was very difficult for the early believers who were obligated to do one thing in obedience to the Lord while the law of the land told them that the complete opposite was accepted and in some instances even required. 
Does that sound familiar? And yet, Paul makes it a point to talk about submitting to government authority. To pay taxes is required to keep the law of the land and as to not face punishment. He punctuates this point by saying, God appoints all leaders. He is never surprised or caught off guard by who ascends to power. It's part of his plan, and it's in his sovereignty. And the God-given purpose of government is to protect, and it's meant to keep sinful man in check and to carry out lawful punishment when people are out of check. But this doesn't mean that government is perfect because it's also run by sinful men. But by the nature of their position, they are due respect, and we're commanded to submit to their authority as long as it doesn't go against God's authority first, and we're commanded also to pray for them. David Guzik put it, puts it this way, Paul's idea is that Christians should be the best citizens of all. Even though they are loyal to God before they are loyal to the state, Christians are good citizens because they are honest, give no trouble, pay their taxes, and most importantly, Pray for the state and for the rulers. So in our study, we read in Matthew 17 how Jesus miraculously made a coin appear to pay the temple tax for both Peter and himself. And I actually um, looked this up because I didn't really understand what the meaning of this passage was. Um, so let's read it together really quick. Um, 17, Matthew 17, starting in verse 24. When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, From strangers. Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, Go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and for you. What Jesus is saying here is that king's sons didn't have to pay taxes. And as the son of God, he likewise was exempt from temple taxes, yet he still paid them. And that's an example for us as to how we're to treat governing authorities. If Jesus paid the taxes and came under their, author their authority in this way, when he was the one who held the true authority, how much more should we submit? That didn't mean that Jesus agreed with everything they were teaching and everything they were saying, and he confronted them multiple times about it. But he still was obedient to God, and he still submitted to the authority that was over him in that way. So in many ways, our country is beginning to look a lot like ancient Rome. Debauchery, sexual deviance, and moral chaos is rampant. I think of some of our own leaders who don't seem very respectable individuals. I've even heard the argument that a believer shouldn't pay taxes because of the way our corrupt government is using those taxes. But as we can see, that's not a biblical idea. Even in Roman times, when certainly taxes weren't being used in the way believers would approve of, Paul told believers to pay them. We, have, we may have leaders ourselves that don't seem worthy of respect due to their actions, but they, are due, but they are due our respect, not because of their actions, but because of their position. And not only that, they are owed our love, which leads us into the next section. So let's go back to Romans, and we're going to read verses 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, Namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So, Paul likens love to a debt that we owe to all mankind. But before you think I'm getting all, all weird on you, we're going to examine what this means. We need to define what love is. And one way of doing that is by looking at what it's not. So let's see if any of these ring a bell. Love is all you need. Love is the answer. 
Love is love. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Sayings like this are touted, and songs like this are touted all over society, and I'm sure you can think of even more. But the problem with these messages is that they don't explain or even really agree on what love is. Many will say things like this thinking that the ultimate goal is a utopian society where there's no fighting or arguing and everyone accepts everyone else and is accepting of all of their actions and everything they do. They liken um, judgment to hate, so there's no judgment in this utopian society upon their chosen lifestyles. Notice I said chosen, it is a choice. There is only this idea of love or their definition of love all the time. But love is not whatever you want it to be. It's not an excuse to live however you want to live. It doesn't mean sexual attraction, desire, or lust. It does not mean affirmation of sin. It does not mean blind acceptance of sin. Certainly attraction, affirmation, and acceptance in their proper context can be components of true biblical love. But to say that loving someone is allowing, or worse yet, applauding their harmful lifestyle is a fallacy. To say that love is being physically intimate with whomever you're sexually attracted to is a fallacy. And believing that love means never disagreeing with anyone else is also a fallacy. While true biblical love may actually be the answer to many of the problems in the world, society's definition of love may actually be the cause of many of the problems in the world. So we would be remiss to look at the biblical definition of love without first referencing the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, love is patient, kind, humble, gentle. Love is part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's self-sacrificing. Love never thinks the worst. It always thinks the best. It endures all things. It trumps all things. And it never fails. But the Bible is full of other scriptures about love. And I have some printed out here. And I'm just going to go through a couple of them. Um, so 1 Corinthians 16, 14 says, Let all you do be done in love. Colossians 3, 14. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Um, 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. And that's just the first half of the first page, and there is three pages here. And this is not an exhaustive list, but if you want a copy, I would be happy to give you a copy. Um, you can go read 1 John 3 and 4, which talk extensively about what love is and where love comes from and how we are to love one another. So there's multiple places in the Bible where it talks about love. The Bible has a lot to say about it. But the most striking thing of all that um, we see in the Bible about love is that it's a commandment. So that tells me that it's actually beyond our fleshly nature. It doesn't come easily or naturally to us. If it did, God probably wouldn't have felt the need to command it of us. It's a commitment. It takes actual work. This goes for any marriage, any relationship, or any interaction that we have with any other human being. It includes our government officials, even though we'll probably never meet them, but they're still our neighbor in the biblical sense, and we are still to love them with a biblical kind of love. Love is being willing to say the hard things, to walk through the hard things. It transcends moodiness, hormones, me time, agendas, itineraries, quarrels, tiffs, hobbies, personalities, ministry styles, and fashion choices. It's not a reaction, it's a deliberate action. And like Paul says, it encompasses the entirety of the law. So biblical love is beyond us. We cannot accomplish it in our own strength. And that's why it's so important for us to put on Christ. So let's turn our attention to the last few verses, starting in verse 11. And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time, to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. 
Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. <clears throat> the reason Paul gives for living this way is because time is short. Every morning we wake up is a day closer to Jesus' return. And we are much closer today than when the believers received this letter in ancient Rome. The night, which means the darkness or the rule of this world, is far spent. The time for Jesus to do away with darkness and make all things new is at hand. And if it was at hand then, how much more is it today? So we walk as in the day, in the light. And the writer of Philippians refers to us as light bearers. I thought that was pretty cool. In the darkness and shadows, things are easier to hide. In Ephesians 5, Paul condemns practices and works of darkness done in secret. In the same passage, Ephesians 5, he again exhorts believers to walk in the light, in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, exposing the works of darkness. Everything will come to light eventually. Everything will be exposed. Secrets don't stay secrets for long. In the words of, of Guzik, they will be made manifest by the light of God's searching judgment. There are multiple chapters in the biblical letters where the writer itemizes the works of darkness. Um, Ephesians 1 is just one of them. Colossians 3 and Galatians 5 are other passages. And our passage here... <coughs> of course, that we just read. Uh, these things are natural to our flesh, and they are contrary to love and life in the Spirit. We as believers don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's a struggle and a battle that we do with our flesh every day, and it's fitting in battle to put on some sort of protective armor. Our study did a really great job of diving into Ephesians 6, the armor of God. So just really quick as a reminder, I'm going to list them here. Our spiritual armor is truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, and salvation. Our weapons are the word of God in prayer and supplication. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, it adds that love is part of that armor too. And of course, the source of all of these things is Jesus. Paul ends our passage by telling us to put on Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. When we're walking with Jesus and walking in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of our flesh. We will love our neighbor. We will be good citizens, not only of country, but also of the kingdom of heaven, which is the most important. I'll end by quoting the last group discussion question in our study because I loved how it put it for us. It says, you were clothed in Christ at salvation. Now it is up to you to daily put on the armor of God. What steps can you take to ensure that you follow through? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your instruction and that you don't just give us instruction and leave us on our own to figure it out, but that you provide the tools and the armor and the way for us to be successful in following your instruction and being obedient. Jesus, thank you for clothing us in your righteousness. You are so good, Lord. I pray that you would be in the discussion around the tables tonight and that you would go before us the rest of this week. Let us walk in light as you are light. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Morgan. That was excellent. That was very good. Very good explanation of that entire chapter. So, all right. I have a few announcements. The youth raffle tickets are now on sale. So, see uh, Daniel or Renee, and the youth are going to start selling raffle tickets. There's some really cool stuff that they got. And there's that grill out there, and there's um, dinners at fancy restaurants, and I don't even know all that they have, but... We'll be letting you know that. But anyways, that's a way to support the kids to go to camp um, by buying raffle tickets. And uh, the dessert auction is coming up. And the date on that is um, the 7th, April 7th. Yes. 
All right. Yeah. And that's another way to help the youth go to camp. They're going to a really cool camp in Prescott again this year. And, you know, like everything, the cost has gone up. Even camp cost has gone up. So we try to have some um, fundraisers for them so that it's not such a hardship on the parents. And some kids wouldn't even be able to go without the fundraising. So if you can help with that. Um, and then we do have a work day for Princess T tomorrow after Bible study. Um, if you can stay and help with that, or, well, you won't be here, but you can come back and help with that if you'd like to tomorrow at 11. We'll be doing that. We're, we're doing good. We have um, a lot of the things that need to be made, made, but there's still some more work to do. So if you'd like to come and do that, that'd be great. And then you're invited to the dress rehearsal on the Thursday, the 11th of April. That will be really a fun time if you're not coming to the tea to come and see the whole program and the production. <laughs> it's really cute. I think every year it can't get better and I think it's better <laughs> if that's possible. And then um, Easter Sunday is this coming Sunday. So invite a friend or a neighbor. We'll be outside. If you can bring a pastry or fruit to share in between, we want to have food for people. There's a sign up out in the, on the carts out there. And then the eggs, the Easter eggs, you can um, fill some. We're gonna have a great big Easter egg hunt. We've rented a huge um, jump fun thing. It's got a couple slides and we're gonna have a barbecue after. So um, and that's a great morning to invite your neighbors or people that maybe don't always come to church, maybe a coworker, so. It's going to be fun. Now, I'm going to talk about something that, oh, mystery dinner. Get your tickets for the mystery dinner. And it's a mystery. I have no idea what we're having. <laughs> so, but that's always a fun end of the Bible study year. So we only have two studies left after tonight, correct? And then the mystery dinner. So this year has gone, or is it three? Three. Three and then the mystery dinner. Oh, good. Whew. So. Um, I'm going to talk about Ladies' Night Out, which is in December. So I'm just going to share with you the idea, and because um, I want it to be perky, I'll I'll show you some pictures of what we can do next um, week. But um, anyway, so what we're going to do this year is, if you, we're going to try to see if we can get 25 ladies or more to host their own table, bring their own china, and make their own centerpiece, and. Um, what a fun thing to do. So they, we used to do China, and one of the advantages of us doing that is we don't have to buy all the paper goods. It will help us keep the cost down, actually, and we won't have to buy all the centerpieces, but it's also beautiful. So up in Castle Rock, where I taught this last uh, December, they did three nights in a row because they sell out. And so they do three nights in a row of Ladies' Night Out, and um, they do China and centerpiece, and it's super fun because all you have to do is one table. So you can do it cute, you can do it simple, or you can do it elegant. Um, but the reason I'm talking to you about it now is if you don't have china and you'd like to thrift store this summer to get your, your china and kind of come up with your own theme, I'll have some pictures next week of some ideas that they did up there, and it was absolutely beautiful. In fact, they open the doors a half an hour early, which we do too for Photobot, but so ladies can come in and just see all the tables. So we're going to shoot for that. So just so I could get a feel, does anybody in here think, oh, that would be fun. I'd like to do that. Oh, good. Okay. That's encouraging. So I think we'll go for it and we'll see what, what happens. So God bless you as you go to your groups.